So, and I would like to say a big thank you to Prof. Mahmoud for doing a lot of the work for me already. Um, guess what? I don't know of any center in West Africa right now where we are doing liver transplantation. Uh, resection is just started in some of the centers. So it looks like we have a long way to go uh, in order to catch up with um, Egypt and the rest of the world. So in as much as surgery is regarded as a gold standard for treatment for a lot of uh, HCC, most times, uh, most of the patients will present at a stage where surgery is not even an option for them. They may not be surgical candidates at the time of presentation. A lot of literature has stated that less than 15% of people actually benefit from surgery. But guess, guess what? In Ghana, we do a multi-department meeting. And in the last one year, we have seen over 300 cases of HCC. And less than 10 of them came in the early stage. Less than 5%. And so this is the reality of what we face. It is also said that even for people who get surgery, sometimes they get, intra, they, they get recurrence, like Prof mentioned. And systemic chemotherapy sometimes also uh, doesn't help so much. So with all these problems, they've led to the emergence of other liver-directed therapies, including ablative therapies like radiofrequency ablation, microwave ablation, internal injection, which is no longer practiced, but uh, uh, used to be very effective. And then also we have the intra-arterial embolization, uh, such as radio embolization and uh, trans-arterial chemoembolization. So what are the factors to consider? Like I mentioned, access to healthcare. In certain places, you don't have uh, transplant, access to transplant. You don't have access to even resection. And also, access to other uh, para specialists who manage liver diseases, like interventional radiologists, hepatologists, are just absent. There are other things you have to consider, such as the stage of the HCC, as well as the performance status. And here, I come back to the same uh, BLCL criteria that Prof had showed earlier. So the first part, all these people, the very early stage as well as the early stage is ablation, transplant, resection, ablation. In most centers, like I said, these options are not available. And even ablation is not available in many countries. Last time we had a liver meeting in Ouagadougou, it was surprising. Many countries do not even have access to microwave ablation or radio frequency ablation. So this is where we face. However, it is easier to train people to be able to do things like ablation, to be able to do things like chemoembolization um, earlier and maybe faster than getting to train people to uh, do resections, as well as it is cheap compared to doing surgery. And so these treatments, I think, that are very, very much needed in our uh, countries who do not have access to a lot of treatment. So I'm going to focus on ablation as well as um, trans-arterial chemoembolization as a treatment. Ablation actually can be curative. We have a cohort in Ghana of about, about 10 patients who have all lived beyond two years and we are still following them up. Uh, there are times where you achieve complete cure as a result of um, ablation. And as you can see here, most of these patients in the first phase are living five years and beyond. So which way? This is our famous Mohamed Salah, Mo Salah, we affectionately call him. This is a player who is playing the EPL, has access to the best of stadium, best of coaches, best of uh, technology, because this, this football is even technology. People are working out so many different ways to uh, be able to score. If we put Mo Salah in my stadium in Ghana to play Kumasi Asante Kotoko, maybe the biggest team that we know in Ghana, his performance is going to be way, way, way below what he's doing right now. The point I'm making is that treatment in Egypt as it stands now is going to be different from treatment in Ghana. And so 
we have to face the reality, see what is available in our various countries, and see how we can adapt, while at the same time trying to chase the rest of the world, so that Prof. Mahmoud will not leave us too far. <laughs> so you have a patient who has um, T1 or T2, very early or early stage disease, with liver uh, cirrhosis. The question is, how will you treat this patient? And that goes back to my earlier image. It depends on where you find yourself. So for this patient in my country, for instance, at our MDT, me and my surgeons and everybody agree that we will offer like um, either microwave ablation or radio frequency ablation for a patient like this. Because uh, it's difficult, we don't have transplantation and resection is also um, more consuming, more expensive, as well as recurrence can happen. But in this patient, we offer microwave ablation. Even if they get recurrence, we can treat them again. You can treat as many times as they recur. The key is that you have to put the patient on surveillance so that you can pick up recurrences early and offer them treatment. And there's a patient, when I was training in Singapore, we had a patient who we had done ablation for 10 times. And the patient was living 10 years and over. And so we think that it's a cheaper way to be able to treat a lot of our patients. It is also minimally invasive. And like I said, it is repeatable. or You can do it over and over again. And patients are living five years, actually 10 years, about 60% of them are still alive from some of the studies that have been done elsewhere. How is ablation done, especially microwave ablation? It's a very simple gadget. This one costs less than $10,000. Of course, the antennas are expensive, but we can replicate a lot of this in our various centers in West Africa or uh, Sub-Saharan Africa where it is difficult to get great expertise like Egypt has. So we can replicate this in a lot of centers train radiologists across, and even some physicians, to be able to do ablation. Well, I prefer microwave ablation for many reasons. It, has, uh, it is affected less by heat sink effect. Normally, the vessels around the tumor, as you treat something, they cool the effect. And also, um, there's consistently higher intratumoral pressures, which also tends to prevent recurrence which is uh, reported to be higher with radio frequency ablation than microwave ablation. You also achieve larger ablation zones. It is faster for me as a radiologist, no grounding parts, shorter ablation times, and you can uh, go within a short time. You can also treat uh, with simultaneous uh, multiple probes, multiple antennas, so that for larger lesions, sometimes for palliative care, you can do multiple um, ablations. So standard uh, pre-procedure or pre-surgery evaluation is done. We do CT, dynamic CT studies, uh, check liver function, and all the basic things before we start the procedure. We review the CT images, which select a suitable trajectory. So you plan everything, decide on how you're going to um, advance your antenna into the lesion, all under sonographic guidance. And most times we just do this even with local anesthesia and a little conscious sedation and we are fine. So this is a patient of mine, uh, 59 years old. She's the teacher. She came to me and it was less than uh, just about two mm lesion. As you can see on the arterial face, this is the lesion enhancing. And we treated her, her alpha fetoprotein levels returned to normal follow up, there was no enhancement on CT, and this is while we were doing the ablation under ultrasound guidance, and she's still doing well three years on. So normally there's a chart, so you have to look at the size of your tumor, and then compare to what wattage you want to use, what time you want to use, the power settings and all of that. And it is quite an easy uh, procedure. For larger lesions, you may go in multiple times, readjust your antenna, and be able to achieve bigger ablation zones. And normally, you see that echogenic area that I just showed, which comes like a cigar head during ablation. And um, 
There it is. And that tends to give you an idea of where your ablation zone is. Once you stop the ablation, that also disappears. And normally it stays for only eight hours. After that, you don't see it again. So how do we assess the patient? In some centers, a day after the procedure, they take you to CT. Some even do it immediately after doing the ablation. Do a CT scan, check for any enhancement within the ablation zone. And if there is, then you know there's either incomplete ablation or if you do it one month after, like I do it in my center, then you know there's either a recurrence or incomplete ablation. However, for a technical success, you are looking for no enhancements within the area. Within one month, some people would have normalized their alpha fetoprotein. Some will be dropping. And once you follow up, you see that it returns to normalcy. And for us, that is what we, uh, we call um, complete ablation. So ablation is an exciting technique. It's very effective. It is cheap and low incidence of complications. And people can learn it a bit more easily so that more people can afford, can offer these services. How about taste? Transarterial chemoembolization is a very simple concept as well. We know that most of the arterial supply to the liver, normal liver, tends to come from the portal vein. But when, when there's an HCC, most of it is supplied by the hepatic arteries. And so what we do in this case is that go put in chemo into the hepatic artery that is supplying the tumor, lock it down with lipidol because lipidol carries uh, the chemo and at the same time it, it loves the liver uh, hepatocytes uh, in the HCC. So it stays there, it stays there. And once we finish, we block off the artery, we embolize it, and it can stay in for weeks and to years. So by so doing, you are able to maintain a high concentration of the chemo within the tumor for a long time. And that is how taste works. So basically, you are introducing chemo into the hepatic artery that is supplying the tumor. After that, you block it off and then leave it. And these days, actually, we even go through the radial artery. We go through brachial artery. In the past, I was going only through the groin. But these days, we can go through uh, multiple accesses. And the patients actually tolerate it better. Because if I go through the groin, the patient has to stay six hours or four hours strict bed rest uh, before doing anything. But through the arm or through the wrist, we can do it. And the patient walks by himself straight away after the procedure onto the bed. So this has also been used as a neoadjuvant therapy with the hope of reducing tumor size, inducing tumor necrosis, and preventing dissemination during surgery for resectable HCC. And actually, the American, American Association for Study on Liver Diseases, as well as Easy, Easy recommend TAS as a first-line uh, non-curative therapy for non-surgical patients with large or multifocal HCC who do not have vascular invasion or hepatic spread. It's important also to note why you don't need vascular invasion, especially for the portal vein. Because once you are blocking the uh, hepatic arteries, remember that you still need the liver to have good blood supply, and that will come from the portal vein. So if the portal vein is invaded, it is some sort of relative contraindication. These days, if left is blocked, you can actually do selective chemoembolization and all of that. So, And taste involves mixing some chemo drugs, uh, doxo, cisplas, and mitomycin. One of the problems with it is that there is no standardized protocol in terms of even how much you should administer and which drug you should administer in preference to other ones. So it's a gray area, and that leaves us with some problems sometimes. So there is ischemic effect as well as a therapeutic effect. You know, lipidol can actually cause ischemia in addition to uh, staying, keeping the chemo drugs within the uh, tumor. And so that embolic action plus the regional chemotherapy gives you the synergistic effect. And it gives you less systemic toxicity and damage to normal liver cells. Uh, we commonly use some of these particles. Uh, I love to use gel foam, uh, gel foam with the chemo as well as lipidol. And we also use DC beads sometimes. We do not have 
why why terium? So we, we don't do um, sets, we don't do Y90 embolizations and all of that, but we are able to do tests as it stands now. Contraindications, as you can see, child C and also people with some intractable systemic infections, uh, people who have other medical issues. Complications um, occurs in about 50% of cases. People will have some sort of post-embolization syndrome. They just have a mild fever and sometimes nausea, vomiting. I've also had a patient who had a liver failure um, and sometimes abscess, but um, we, we try to manage all of them. Abscess will go back and put in the drainage catheter for a number of days, antibiotics, and they are good to go. So there have been several studies looking at taste and uh, conservative management, and whether it works or it doesn't. And the breaker came in the year 2002 when this study in Hong Kong and Barcelona actually showed some positive uh, statistic significance. And so since then, taste has been uh, approved in many centers. These are other studies too. Um, and this is a case of a 56-year-old uh, Ghanaian lady who has been on treatment for over 10 years, uh, had a nodule in segment 4, which was stable, but came back again, and we saw a small nodule, less than 2 centimeters, with um, hypervascularity on ultrasound and on CT scan, classic symptoms, background liver cirrhosis. And so for a patient like that, uh, we do our angiogram, celiac, and then uh, do selective embolization of the side that is supplying the tumor. In this particular patient, after we went ahead and did microwave ablation. And so again, combination therapy is important for us. And this is the tumor now taking the lipidol. Actually, it's very, very bright. And so once the tumor um, feeds on that, it changes its density and you can see it easily. And in ending, in conclusion, I just want to say that let's encourage cooperation among physicians. Uh, HCC is not a one discipline job. It involves both radiologists, uh, hepatologists, our transplant and uh, resection surgeons, um, and many other people, oncologists. So let's work together. In my center, we have a weekly meeting where we review all cases and decide which one should have this treatment or that treatment. Based on the, we, we agree that the BLCL criteria may not work for us necessarily. I mean, what to work in Barcelona may not work in Accra the same way. So we try to do our own modifications in the best interest of our patients. Also, we need to offer training for more physicians so they can offer some of these thermal ablative uh, techniques. They are not so difficult to do. In the past, in Ghana, people would say, why should I do screening? When I know that if there's HCC, I can't do anything about it. So patients were not even encouraged. But now we are getting some of these things, and the evidence is clear that if we're able to pick some of these lesions early enough, we can offer them some sort of treatment that may take them uh, some years. We should also do awareness creation. We should let people, especially the at-risk population, can we let them know the dangers of not taking their medication, dangers of not going for your screening? Because we need to ensure that uh, screening is done and we pick up some of these lesions early enough to be able to offer them uh, good treatment options. We should also have national policy and direction. I think the, the story of Egypt is a great one and we all have to learn from Egypt. I think that um, some of us do not know of any national policies directed as treating some of these conditions. Even if they exist, they are only on paper. Uh, which we do very well in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Everything is on paper, it's in the pipeline, and that is our favorite mantra. So we have to take this down and make sure that we can do something uh, practical. Of course, research and development. I know Professor Louis Robert is doing a lot of cooperation, a lot of studies 
within West Africa trying to do some genetic studies to see who is at risk and what will work best uh, for treatment. And of course, partnerships with countries like Egypt to follow what you are doing here will also be very helpful. Thank you very much.